All right. Okay, and you were exclusively a tail gunner. Mm -hmm. And you flew 35 missions. Yes. After which you returned to the United States or? Yes. Okay, all right. Okay, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted when I was 17. I took the uh, exam for an air crew member. Okay. And uh, I was just, I passed the exam and I waited until I was eight, they waited until I was 18 uh, before they could take me in. Okay. And where were you living at the time? Uh, West Haven, Connecticut. Okay. Why did you join? Why did you volunteer? Well, that was during a time when uh, a lot of my classmates who were a year or so older than I was were joining and I, it was the time when everyone was patriotic because of the happenings at Pearl Harbor. Okay. Uh, some of the other ones could join the Navy and the Marines when they were 17, so we, we lost a lot of our, uh, didn't lose them, but we lost a lot of our people to uh, the armed services uh, at that age. Okay. Why did you pick the branch that you joined? Why did you pick the Army Air Force? Well, I always had an interest in, in flying. It fascinated me when I was a youngster, and I uh, made a lot of models that I was interested in. And you know, I used to go to these little barnstorming air shows. They had one in, in West Haven, which was actually in a farmer's field, and they used to give uh, rides in the airplanes. Wow. Okay. Okay. Can you recall your first days in the service? Can you try describe that a little bit for us? Uh, that was your basic training that you received initially? Yes, uh, I was inducted. I went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and from there I went down to uh, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, where I took my basic training. Mm -hmm. I was there for two months, and uh, I took, we took tests for air crew exam mm -hmm. to uh, test our dexterity and uh, uh, things of that nature, and then uh, they, they said that they had enough pilots and, and navigators and bombardiers and what they really needed was gunners. Okay. So the, the 500 of us who were in the class at Greensboro uh, were sent down to Harlingen, Texas for gunnery training. All 500 of you? All of us. Okay. What did it feel like? Can you just describe how you were feeling at the time? Was it really exciting? Were you a little bit scared? Tell me all about that. Well, you're always a little apprehensive about uh, what you're, you don't know about. But we went down to uh, gunnery training in Harlingen and uh, it was uh, very comprehensive and there were things, I never shot a gun before in my life. Mm -hmm. And when I got then, down there, I, I shot everything from a BB gun up to a 50 caliber machine gun and uh, that was a different experience uh, in my lifetime. Okay. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit specifically when you got to gunnery school, what that was like, perhaps what a typical day was like, how they trained you and so on? Uh, well, um, in other words, did you have like a turret that you were doing your target shooting from or did they just initially expose you to the guns first and then you talked a bit before, for instance, about the, uh, the testing for losing oxygen, things like that, so maybe you can describe that. Okay. Um, the first guns we ever shot were a BB machine gun, and it was like in a, a shooting gallery in an amusement park. And they had ducks and targets moving across uh, in front of us, and we'd shoot at them with BB guns. Okay. Uh, after that, uh, a lot of our training was with uh, shotguns. And, and using the shotguns, we used to ha go out every day and shoot uh, 25 rounds of shotguns uh, in ski or trap shooting. And the reason for doing that is uh, so you'd get uh, the feeling of leading your target. In, in order to shoot trap and, you sh and, the, and the target is flashing in front of you, uh, you have to give it some leading. So we, we uh, uh, were trained in shooting these uh, shotguns not only on the ground, but then they had an oval track where you, you were in the back of the truck with a 12-gauge shotgun. And when you went around the track, there were 25 houses that shot clay pigeons out at you at all directions. And, and from the back of the truck, we had to shoot at those pigeons. And there were times where you, you just didn't have time to bring it up to your shoulder. You had to shoot them from your hip. 
in order to get them flying out of these different angles. Some of them were flying directly at you, some were flying away from you, some were flying uh, ho across horizontally. Mm -hmm. And it was just uh, a wonderful experience in a training uh, to, to test your reaction, uh, reactions against something that, uh, that you haven't experienced before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you tell me a bit about the, uh, the training for oxygen deprivation? Can you tell me that story again, please? Uh, they, uh, in the classes, they explained to us about uh, uh, passing out when you, uh, from lack of oxygen, which they call it. Uh, 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 let's see, what the hell was it now? Uh, it's not anorexia. No, 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 no. Uh, geez, I had it. Uh, they taught us about anoxia. And uh, w what they did, they took around 20 of us and put, it as, put us into a decompression chamber. And there, was, there were seats along the sides of the chamber. And they took uh, a first group of, of fellows, about three or four of them, and they sat them down in the, in the aisle and asked them uh, to row like they were rowing a boat. And so they were all rowing together, and then they, they uh, disconnected their oxygen, and they all slumped over. Now, after they, co they connected the oxygen again, the guys picked their heads up and start rowing like nothing ever happened. And they were telling, that was just to show us the dangers of it, because you have no experience of passing out, you have no knowledge of, of uh, how, how you could die if it was deprived any, for any period of time. But it, and it also showed that when you come to, you, you don't remember a thing, but you go back to doing the same thing you were doing before you passed out. Mm -hmm. uh, in my case, uh, they told me to time, uh, untie my shoelaces and then tie them up again. So I started with my shoelaces, and uh, I had the feeling that every, I was under control. Uh, there was nothing that was bothering me. And then they, they disconnected my oxygen. And then they connected my oxygen again, and I started tying my shoes again. And I said, well, what did you do that for? I, I, was, I knew what I was doing. And that brought the fact to me that I didn't know what was going on, and you have no uh, memory of passing out at all. So that means it's a pretty serious thing, potentially. Absolutely. And I think that brought it home to all, all the students there that uh, the dangers of, of having lack of oxygen. Okay. Do you remember your instructors at all? Any particular instructors? Or? No. Uh, I had some that were, uh, uh, what they had, they had also was what they call a Waller trainer. Okay. Now, uh, later this was used in the movies, uh, the screen was used in the movies. You go into this building and the screen was uh, uh, elliptical. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a, like a wide screen that they later come out with in the movies. And you, you sat at a, a, a position that was like being in a, in a turret, and right. you, had a, you had an electronic machine gun in front of you. Mm -hmm. And they would uh, have about four or five different cameras focusing different, different uh, uh, images on the screen. And you, you'd have planes coming out of the right, planes coming out of the left, and you had to swing this electronic uh, machine gun around and tried to shoot them down and it, it was it tested your reaction it tested how, how well you could uh, uh, lead them in the speeds they were going and uh, it was real great training wow. and that was that was something that was invented just for that purpose and yet later they used it in in the motion picture industry huh. now what did you do after that training in Texas take us from there well uh, after that we went to uh, we went to Westover Field and we were there for uh, to meet our crew. And where is Westover Field? Westover Field is in Massachusetts, okay. and uh, you're just sitting around with all all the gunners and there were officers there, and they'll, they'll, they call out their names, and uh, each they call out ten names, and then you'd meet, and that was your crew. You'd introduce yourself to each other, and uh, from then on, we were known as Kalash's crew, who was our pilot. Okay. Uh, can you spell that last name for me, Kalash? K-O-L-I-C-I-A. Kalash's crew. Okay. Some good alliteration there. 
So how long did you guys spend in Westover? Oh, we just that was just for, for uh, uh, combining the uh, different uh, the gunners and the radio men and the engineers uh, with the uh, uh, pilots and the navigators. From there, we went down to Chatham Field, Georgia, where we stayed there for two months, and and all we did was fly every day. There were days where we had what they call a, a touchdown and takeoff where you just touch the wheels down and take off again and circle the field and touch down and take off and you did that for hours. That tested the dexterity of the pilot. I yep, it got him used to landing the plane and, and in all, all kinds of weather. Okay, that was a B-24 at that point? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, what happened after that? Uh, we went on cross-country trips uh, on flights to uh, we went to, flew to Florida. We never touched down any place. We, we'd fly to the given target and then back again. We fly to the Bahamas and back again. And uh, we flew not as a squadron but as an individual crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was just at different parts of the country and, and getting acquainted with each other. We'd stay at our positions. We'd correspond through our intercom and uh, we just worked together as a crew. So basically you were simulating bombing runs mm -hmm. over friendly territory, of course. It, it, yes. Well, it was actually getting acquainted with each other and, and, and reacting to each other. Learning how to really work as a team, sure. basically, which is really critical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then at that point, did you go overseas? or? Well, uh, we were supposed to go overseas, but then they, uh, they cited our crew to go to Langley Field, Virginia, and uh, there we, would, we dropped off our navigator and we picked up a new navigator who was radar trained and they called them Mickey men. Uh, radar was uh, uh, comparatively new to the United States Air Force. It had been used in, in England for uh, uh, England, the English uh, dis uh, invented it mm -hmm. um, for bombers because they did a lot of night bombing and they needed uh, the radar. Mm -hmm. So uh, we picked up the, uh, Lieutenant Peter Wilson, who was our, our navigator, and we flew with him for two months. And uh, the, the training we, do, we did at, uh, from Langley Field was strictly uh, radar training. It was, all, all the navigation was done by radar, whether it was uh, uh, bad weather or good weather, uh, he directed the ship with the radar. And it was a training for him and a training for us and getting to know each other. So at that point, it was probably 1944. Yes. Because if you were 18 when you finally were called in, that would have been 1943. So I'm assuming after all this training had gone on, you're now into 1944. Well, uh, I actually went in in, in January of 44. Okay. Because I wasn't 18 until November of 43. Right. Okay. All right. And <clears throat> at this point, you're still stationed in Georgia. Is that correct? Uh, Langley, Langley Field, Virginia. Okay. Um, take us from there. What happened after that? Well, after that, we were assigned overseas, and uh, we picked up a, a brand new B-24, and we flew it up to uh, Maine, and from Maine, we went up to uh, Labrador, Gander Field, and from Gander Field, we flew to the Azores, and uh, from the Azores, we flew to Marrakesh in Africa, and then from, uh, we stayed there for couple of weeks because we had a we found that we had a leak in, in one of the gas tanks huh. so they had to repair that and then from there we flew to Tunis and then from Tunis we flew to our home base in Italy Pantanella Pantan okay did you get a chance when you were in Africa to explore a little bit of Africa or did they have any time for you to do that or? well the only the only uh, we did go to town in Marrakesh okay. and of course that was uh uh, quite an experience. We went to the bazaar, which is the marketplace in the center of Marrakech, and we, we saw these uh, snake charmers and uh, types of things that we, we just read about previously. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of an exotic experience, yeah. you could say, to be sure. Okay, so you arrived in Panatella, and if, do you remember what month in 1944 that was? It was in uh, the end of October of 44. Okay. All right. So at that point, 
the same crew was still together that had been put together in Westover, Massachusetts. There yes. No more substitutions. Yeah. Well, okay. When we, when, we, when we got to our, our base there, um, they took Pete Wilson away from us. Who was that trained he, navigator? He was the radar. trained radar navigator because uh, all the planes didn't have the uh, radar. Just the lead planes and the deputy lead plane had radar. So he was slated to fly with the uh, group leaders. Okay. And lead the, lead the squadrons. Okay. Well, why don't you take us from there to your first combat mission, which I'm assuming was relatively quickly after you arrived in Italy, or? Uh, our first one was November 4th, 1944. And... Uh, At that point, you're approaching 19 years old then. Yes. Getting close. It was a couple of weeks before I was 19. Uh, when we first fly, uh, the, the previous night, you, you always go up and look at the bulletin board to see if your name is on it. And uh, the night of the 3rd, Kalashas was slated to fly on the 4th. Uh, in the morning, we were awakened 5.30 in the morning, and we uh, went to Chow. Mm -hmm. After Chow, we went to uh, get our electric heated suit. Uh, we, we were flying in temperatures of 40 degrees below zero. And, uh, and from there, we went to our briefing. Uh, when you go into the briefing, uh, they, they have a, a stage set and they have a curtain drawn over the stage. And you sit down and uh, when everyone's seated, the commander will come in and, and pull the curtains, and that'll indicate your your target. Now, the first mission that we flew, it was to Linz, Austria. And uh, being newcomers, we didn't know what to expect, but we heard the veterans in the in the uh, with the in the rest of the uh, auditorium groan. So we said, uh, we didn't know what that meant, but. After they picked us up uh, on a, on a, with a truck, and they took several crew members down to their respective planes, and when they were going down to the planes, there was not much much talking going on. Uh, they dropped us off at, at the, each of our planes. Uh, when we we took off, let's see first. You have to wait for a signal from the tower. If it's a red flare, the the uh, flight is canceled for the day. If it's a green flare, it's it's a go. And that a red flare could be caused by uh, weather problems on the way up, uh, uh, and and anything. If the if the original target is is uh, obscured and there's no way to to bomb that target, they they might cancel it, or else they might send you to an alternate target. But in any event, when, when the green Flare was, was shot up, that was a go. Uh, we were at a, a, a base that had a double runway. So uh, when we went out to taxi to the runways, they would alternate. You took off from the left runway, uh, you were down the runway. 30 seconds later, the one they took off from the second runway. And every, at 30 second intervals, the plane would take off. Uh, of course, this was to get the planes in the air as soon as possible so we could get our formation set up. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me again, describe uh, what a, uh, how many planes in a squadron, how many planes in a bomber group, and maybe the average number of planes that would go on a mission? Well, uh, a group had, our group had four squadrons in it, and each squadron on a normal uh, bombing uh, uh, excursion would be seven planes from each squadron okay. and used to fly uh, two triangles and then a, a seventh plane at in, in the base of, it, of the uh, uh, squadron. Uh, when they had what they called, um, oh, what the heck was it? Squadron sometimes would have uh, from seven to twelve, seven was a normal uh, mm -hmm. uh, day, but they have up to 12 planes for each squadron. On a maximum effort. On a maximum effort. Okay. Uh, 
these usually resulted in these thousand plane raids you talked about. Now, I, I always envisioned the, the, the sky being loaded with planes, a thousand of them at a time, but that isn't what happened. Each group went over the target. They all had uh, target destination times. Mm -hmm. And w what really happened is that the, the target was bombed for, we'll say, from uh, 11.30 to maybe 2 o'clock. And it was a steady stream of bombers going over. And that was a maximum effort uh, of 1,000 planes. If it was a normal uh, mission, it, that's the way they still did it. But it, it would be in, in, in uh, each group had their own destination time. Okay. Because uh, if, if, you, if you could, well, first of all, uh, in this, when they, the way they had the group set up and the squadron set up, uh, every you you might think that every every plane has its own uh, bomb site, but that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. The only bomb sites uh, that they had in, in a squadron was in the uh, lead plane or the deputy lead plane, and possibly a third plane. And everybody else just had a toggle switch. Mm -hmm. and, and when you saw the, um, the the lead plane drop its bombs. You hit the toggle switch and you drop your bombs. This way you formed a pattern. You weren't all aiming for the same uh, point. Mm -hmm. So the pattern, he'd, he'd aim for the, uh, one portion of the, of the target, mm -hmm. and then the, t the pattern would develop from the toggle switches of the bombs. Okay. So when you say there were usually just one or two, sometimes three, uh, you said bombardiers or navigators you meant? No, the, the bombardiers still flew in the planes, but they didn't have a bomb site. Okay. So only, they didn't always have a bomb site. So only a limited number of planes had the bomb site. Right. And that would be two or three planes per group. Right. Meaning per 28 total planes on a typical run. Right. Okay. And it had a twofold uh, purpose, too, because uh, the Norden bomb site was supposed to have been a secret. You know, it was, it was a revolutionary type of bomb site that was used by the Americans. What did they uh, say? You could hit a pickle barrel from two well, miles up or something like that. If you could see it, you could, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, and, and the fact that they didn't have them in every plane is if any of the planes got shot down, the enemy wouldn't get the bomb site. Right. Okay. So there was a minimum of those used in the bombing run. Can you tell me, obviously you hit a variety of types of targets. Maybe you can describe the most whether it be an oil field or a munitions factory or enemy positions. Can you describe some of the different targets that you would hit, please? Um, our first, well, first, uh, all our targets were um, primarily to cripple the, uh, the German uh, uh, machine. Uh, we we uh, bombed their oil, oil refineries, the oil depots, and then we also bombed the uh, marshalling yards that uh, the trains used to, to, to uh, uh, carry the munitions and such to different parts of Germany. So if we, we crippled their trans transportation and we, we uh, crippled their oil, they wouldn't have the oil and, and uh, gasoline to run their tanks and airplanes and such. Right. And uh, uh, so that's where our primary targets were. Well, when you hit an oil refinery, you, uh, the result would be black, black smoke, in, uh, that just uh, uh, enveloped the sky really over the target. Mm -hmm. um, when you hit a marshalling yard, uh, you could see the bomb strikes uh, more easily because it it just left the puffs of smoke from from the bomb itself. As a tail gunner, I was responsible also for uh, watching the, uh, surveying the target after the bombs were dropped, mm -hmm. and then it, it, when we went back to briefing after the mission was over, uh, they would ask the tail gunners because they were the last one to see the target in the plane, mm -hmm. uh, from the plane, and uh, we would tell them how accurate or how inaccurate where we saw the bombs drop, and and uh, how well we did, mm -hmm. because. Um, we always had uh, landmarks that they pointed out to us in the briefing. Mm -hmm. if, if there was a river there, you'd, you'd know that the bomb was supposed to be dropped in certain, to the right of the river or just over the river or 
to the left of it, or there were uh, building landmarks that you you memorized and you knew uh, if you dropped the bombs in that area, you knew that you had a good hit. Okay. Now, obviously, a lot of guys didn't make it back. There were a lot of casualties. Would you say that, could you give us a sense of, on your average mission, um, what percentage of planes you would lose? Can you, can you speak to that at all? Sort, well, of, sort of a statistic? Well, it's hard to determine or say that, uh, you know, uh, the percentage from each one. Uh, there were some, some uh, missions we went on, there were no casualties at all. Oh, right. And there were other ones that we went on, that there were quite a few casualties. Mm -hmm. um, there were some casualties that were uh, not caused by the enemy. Uh, sometimes we'll go to a target that was uh, we, what we thought was a fairly easy target. And sometimes, uh, I know uh, a couple of times there was uh, collisions trying to maintain a tight formation sometimes. Something, something happened and there was a mid-air collision where uh, both planes were damaged and, and went down. Um, on our field, there, there was a couple of planes that, that uh, on takeoff, the nose wheel collapsed for some reason, and the bombs went off before they got... The, now, even though the bombs were armed, it was the uh, concussion of, of the plane hitting that set the bombs off, and, and they exploded at the end of the runway. Uh, and those are casualties, of course, it's still caused by the war, but it, they weren't caused by enemy fire. Uh, the flak was was probably our most dangerous uh, adversary because uh, you you can't imagine I I flew uh, when I was flying I, I wanted to see what the other uh, turrets were mm -hmm. so I I flew the I flew the nose turret and he took my place in the tail well when I was when you were in the tail you don't see anything coming at you you just you see behind you you see where you've been but you don't see anything in front of you. When, when I was flying in the, in the nose turret, I got a perspective that I never had before because I heard Shorty, who was our nose gunner, say, oh, I see a plane going down here, or I see a plane going down there, or this one's going into a flat spin. And, and then he says, well, it looks like there's a lot of flak up there. And I never realized the the type of of terror he might have gone through by just seeing these things, like when we were on the on the bomb run, the sky is just loaded with black with the flak exploding. If if they were, if the Germans happened to get the altitude you were flying at, and you knew you had to fly through that, you can't deviate from your bomb run. Uh, the uh, lead bombardier who is sighting the drop. Has, he takes over the plane uh, as you're on the bomb run, and he's, he's controlling the flight of the plane. And he has to fly, fly a straight line to the target, and he can't deviate from that at all. And you know you have to go through the flak, and you see it up in front of you. And I experienced something that I, that I, I, I realized that Shorty has to go through every time we fly. So you had a new appreciation of I certainly appreciate yes I certainly did now, I must, would you say that when planes were were shot down or uh, suffered say a mid-air collision did a lot of the guys seem to have an opportunity to parachute out or do you think that most most men were killed when their planes went down well uh, I only saw one that uh, I thought no one got out I didn't see anybody getting out uh, on, on some of the other ones, uh, you, I, I personally didn't see every one of them, but some people in the crew will say, well, there's one, one chute opening, there's another chute opening, and they'd count the chutes. Right. So when we got back to briefing, we'd tell them out of ten, uh, five got out, or six got out, or none got out. It, right. it, it, it varied. Sometimes you go into a flat spin, and um, in a flat spin, you're, you're, I don't know if it's a centripetal force or a centrifugal force, but it holds you and you, you can't move. And in order to get, sometimes you can't get to your parachute to snap it on. And some of the, uh, what you have to do really is crawl along if, and be fortunate enough to get to your chute. Mm -hmm. um, 
in, in the uh, in the nose, uh, uh, when you're bailing out of the nose tur, you have to bail out of the, the uh, where the uh, opening of the nose wheel doors are, and you go out there. Uh, there's several different places where you could, you could go out to Bombay if the doors are open. Uh, the, the belly tur had to open his door and fall out. He was the only one that wore a shoe uh, on his back because he was isolated from the rest of the plane. Mm -hmm. So he would open, he would snap the doors open and he'd just fall out. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pilot and co-pilot are the other two that had uh, their chutes on, the, on their back. How would the, since you were a tail gunner, how would you get out? You'd have to work your way up into the fuselage and then choose. Well, exit. there's a, um, an exit hatch just uh, aft of the, uh, of the waist gunners. Okay. And uh, it was about maybe uh, four, f I don't think it was four by four, maybe three by three. And, and you, that, that was our escape hatch. The waist gunners and the uh, tail gunner, would, you would go out that hatch. Okay. As far as your, your crew, uh, your particular crew of guys that all flew together, did all of those guys survive the war? You said some of them occasionally would fly on other flights. Maybe you could have lost one when he was on another flight. Well, our um, our navigator, as I mentioned earlier, was a, a radar navigator, and he flew with the lead lead planes. And uh, his name was Pete Wilson. Pete Wilson. He come from New York, and he uh, was shot down on his thirty first mission. Uh, it was uh, just outside of uh, Vienna, and, you know he and, and he did not make it. They they said later that he was buried in Austria, uh, along with two other of the crew members. Do you know if he's still there, or was, or his, was his body brought back to the United States? After I don't think so. I don't. I I don't really don't know. Okay. And what kind of varying various fates could a guy suffer when he parachuted? You spoke earlier that some could become prisoners, but some could be at the mercy of angry civilians. Could you just talk briefly, please, about that? Well, when we try to determine how, uh, what happened to Pete, uh, we were given conflicting stories about uh, how he, he uh, got killed. And uh, first they told us he might have hit an obstruction on the plane uh, when, he, when he bailed out. Then, uh, we were told that a chute probably didn't open, and then we told we were told that he was he could have been shot uh, as he was parachuting, and the last uh, uh, thing they told us was that he he could have been killed by civilians who who beat him to death because we heard this did happen, uh, where uh, uh, a person would parachute safely to the ground only to be beaten to death. Obviously some became prisoners of war. <clears throat> and some became prisoners of war, yes. Were there examples where guys may have bailed out behind enemy lines or into the hands of friendly partisans that actually made it back to fly again? That came somehow made it back to base? I know you have a special junker story. We'll save that for a little later, but... Yes, there were. There were. Uh, there was, there was a, a crew that we were, when we were in training with, uh, we, we flew a mission that was up in, uh, I think it was near Czechoslovakia, and uh, they, they were shot down and several of the crew members were killed in, in the uh, explosion in, within the plane. Uh, but the, the plane was crippled, and they, but they made it to Russia. And, uh, the Russians took him in, and uh, they treated him very well, and they eventually came back uh, to fly again. So in other words, they flew beyond Germany to Russia rather yeah. than trying to make it yeah. back the other way. Yeah, that was an option. It was an option. If you knew you couldn't make it back to your home base to try to head for uh, uh, somewhere where there were uh, friendly either partisans or, or uh, allies. I'm assuming that Russia would have been a shorter distance. In this were case, already over Germany, it would be right. quicker to go to right. Russia. Okay, um, let's talk about 
your typical target destinations. We talked about the types of targets, but what countries did you bomb the most? And then others that you didn't go to as much. You mainly were Germany and Austria. And then behind that, what other countries? Uh, <clears throat> we we uh, bombed to support the 8th Army and the 5th Army in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, the, so you bombed uh, in Italy? Right? We bombed in Italy. This was in an area where uh, the, the 5th Army of the United States and the 8th Army of uh, Britain were advancing up the boot of Italy and uh, we were to bomb the German positions to try to get them across a river. Okay. you know what river that was? No, I don't. I don't recall. Okay. <clears throat> and um, uh, we, we went to uh, uh, let's see, Hungary. We went to Hungary a few times. Uh, and I bombed uh, in Hungary. Yes, uh, there was a um, an air aerodrome over there, over in Nova Zamke, and uh, that's when we found out, or we we got an idea that um, the bombing of all all the oil targets were really uh, productive. Uh, there was a lot of ME 262s. Now they they had uh, these jet planes, ME 262s, and uh, when we were bombing uh, this airfield over there, the, there were 262s on the ground and they couldn't get off the ground because you had no, no fuel. So you uh, knew they, that you they had a superior plane, but they, they couldn't fly it because they had no petrol. So you were able to bomb those planes on the ground? Yeah. In Hungary? Yeah. Okay, but did, is it true you primarily bombed targets in Germany and Austria? Is right. that correct? Yeah. Could you briefly name the cities, the main cities or uh, centers that you bombed? Uh, we bombed Munich, we bombed Blackhammer, which is in northern Germany up near Poland, <clears throat> Oswiecim, which is up near Poland, um, Vienna, Linz, uh, Amstetten, uh, Klagenfurt, uh, those are, those are the main, main targets that we were hitting. And we hit a lot of those multiple times. Okay. Which would you say were some of your, can you describe maybe your worst mission or one of your most difficult <clears throat> missions, either because of uh, <clears throat> encountering fighters or flak or whatever? Or Well, our, our third mission was the one that gave us probably uh, the, we had our worst experience, and that was uh, to Munich. I went up to Munich to uh, bomb the marshalling yards up there, and uh, when we turned onto the bomb run, I, we at our initial you, you go to an initial point, and at the, that point you turn onto your bomb run, mm -hmm. and at at that time, uh, our co-pilot asked for an oxygen check. Uh, he checked the uh, had an oxygen check before the target and after the target to ensure that everyone was all right. Well, everyone answered the oxygen check except our, our engineer, who was a, also a gunner in the waist. <clears throat> so uh, Chick said, Chick, who was our co-pilot, said, where's Jerry? He didn't answer. So uh, the, the waist gunner uh, said, he's, he's up behind uh, Volano. They call me Fingers then. He's up behind Fingers. He's, he's up, and I turned around and my, I turned my turret so I could see him, and he was slumped against the side of the plane, and he had passed out. Uh, I know his, his oxygen hose was uh, disconnected, and I, I had a flak suit on, and they're pretty heavy. They were about 40, 40 pounds or so, and there's a, 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 a clasp in the front where you're supposed to pull it, and all the snaps, it's, it's made in two different pieces, the front vest and the back vest and then the sides and you're, when you pull this it's supposed to unsnap everything and it's supposed to fall off you mm -hmm. and I'm pulling on it and I couldn't get the darn thing off and and I couldn't get out of my turret I, 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 I you get in your turret by by grabbing the handles behind your head and pulling yourself up and getting out and I couldn't get out so I, I turned my turret at an angle closest to Jerry 
and uh, I leaned over backwards as far as I could with my feet holding me into the turret and uh, I connected him up and as I connected him up my my hose became undone because in the turret you only have a short hose you don't have any any uh, extra room because it's so tight in there so I, I connected mine up and then between Bob and myself we tried to get Jerry so he wouldn't go back to doing what he was doing so he started for the uh, the uh, electric suit he went to he wanted to plug in the electric suit again and his his hose coming down again but by this time he connected it up again well when i when i connected him up i turned the oxygen on to full so he i figured he if he had, was going to come to he with pure oxygen it'd be he'd come through faster so and i'm tapping him on the head and finally they, they, that's when he he, he uh, made some movement and then we we got him stabilized, and he went back to his position. He went he w went over. Uh, the reason why his oxygen come undone, we had a bomb strike camera in the plane, and he went over to turn the, the camera on, and it was that far away that his oxygen <coughs> became disconnected. <coughs> well. Uh, we were on the bomb run then, and the the plane was bouncing all over the place, and you could hear the the, f the flag bouncing off the skin of the plane coming through the. It was it was uh, it, it was an experience that I, I it, being our third mission, uh, it was something that I didn't. I we, did, we just had no way of knowing what it was going to be like. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we finally get off the target, and they, they we as soon as you drop the bombs away you peel off the target and we we got off the target and uh and we found well, one of our engines we had to feather one of the engines because the engine was when it ran out it probably was hit and it happened to be our engine number three which uh generates all electricity mm -hmm. so uh we had we fell behind our group because we couldn't keep up with them. We were only on three engines, and then one of the other engines wasn't pulling full full power, so we were flying on two and a half engines, and so we fell behind. And because we had no electricity, uh, what we were doing was manually uh, running our turrets to indicate that we had electricity. Because usually the uh, Germans pick on the stragglers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the stragglers are sitting duck for them. Because you don't have the the uh, concentrated firepower as you would from a from a squadron, mm -hmm. so we were we were flying back in. Uh, uh, we were flying so low, we were losing altitude as we were going along. We we flew through the Alps, we're not over. We were flying through the valleys of the Alps, and uh, finally we got to a point. Uh, where we were going to stop at this, I think it was the 95th bomb group. It was a B-17 bomb group that was further north than we were. In Italy. In right. Italy, yes. And uh, uh, Joe, our pilot, called in and he wanted an emergency landing because we, he, we didn't have any gas. Because of the lack of electricity, we couldn't even transfer the gas. We had gas in the outer tanks, but we couldn't transfer it mm -hmm. uh, because the pumps weren't working. And uh, the uh, they told them that we couldn't come in because they had a they had a B17 coming in on one engine, and uh, so uh, we had to do the best we can. So as we were coming in, there was a, a, a runway under construction, and it was there was uh, all vehicles and, and and construction equipment on the runway, so we couldn't run on that. So Joe, he hit the end of the runway just at the end just to touch down the main wheels. Now the wheels had to be cranked down because we had no electricity. The flaps were cranked down, the wheels were cranked down. The nose wheel, there was no crank for that. We had to kick that one out, so we weren't sure if that was gonna hold or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we, when we uh, hit down, the brunt of the, of the landing was taken on the runway uh, for, the, for the main wheels. And then right after that, we rolled off into this field and it was like a farmer's field with furrows, and the, the plane was bouncing up and down. And we weren't sure whether the nose wheel was going to hold or not, because 
the, if the first thing that would go uh, under uh, uh, the jostling like that would be the nose wheel would collapse. Mm -hmm. So we finally come to a halt, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had a, a, a navigator that was flying with us that day because Pete Wilson, our regular navigator, flew with someone else, and he he was experienced. So his name was Sullivan. And I see Sullivan bouncing off the wing off the top, and we're we're just standing there happy to be down, mm -hmm. and he's yelling, "Get get out, get out!" You know, he, he was afraid the plane was going to blow up, and that was the lack of experience that we had, and he had the experience to get to get us out of the plane. So we all jumped out of the plane and ran away, but uh, they they had the ambulance there, the fire trucks there, and everything, and. In the event that we we had we were wounded or, or the, we had were injured in the in the uh, landing of the plane, mm -hmm. but fortunately everything turned out fine. Sounds like a pretty close call, though. Well, it was it was uh, touch and experience. go for a while. Touch and go and quite a learning experience. <laughs> um, can you tell me anything about um, the fighter planes that you encountered, the enemy planes? Did you ever really get a chance to notice that it was a Major Smith or a Fock Wolf or this or that? Or well, the ME-109s ME the ME were the ones that um, were attacking us. And uh, all the training that they gave us in, in, the, in the States was, uh, they call it um, a pursuit curve. Because the, uh, a single a fighter plane is nothing but a flying machine gun, and uh, in order for him to shoot his gun, he has to have the the nose of his plane pointing at your plane. Mm -hmm. So if you are flying along in this in this uh, uh, manner, and he wants to shoot at your plane, he has to keep turning his plane towards the back of your plane. So you know he has a. Uh, a, a prescribed route that he's going to take, and that's where you lead him. You lead him between his plane and the tail of your plane, because he's sliding to the back of your plane all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, that was called a pursuit curve. Now, when we were over there, though, they had changed their tactics. They weren't using the pursuit curve except if they were going on to stragglers. Um, but what they had was they call a, f a company front attack, and. When you're in a, in a squadron of seven planes, you have a concentrated firepower of, of uh, the upper, upper turret and, and the uh, rest of the turrets. If you come in from the top, you have more guns bearing on you. If you come in from the bottom, you have more guns bearing on you because the tail can shoot at you, the base. Can, but if they come in straight, horizontal, they call that a company front attack, attack where the planes were wingtip to wingtip and come in straight at you. The only, the only uh, guns they had to worry about were the nose guns, the, either the nose gun or the tail gun. So they used to have company front attacks that come from their nose or from the tail. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, we didn't have a lot of those because our, our, uh, the, the planes we had that were escorting us did a marvelous job. Of keeping the fighters away. Oh yeah, they. they in fact, we, they, when we went over the targets, you wouldn't even see the fighters around. But they were usually up ahead of us, uh, clearing out anything that was that was coming that we were flying into. Mm -hmm. So uh, they did a, a really wonderful job in keeping us safe. Okay, tell me about you. You said you you had the Tuskegee Airmen escort you at times. Yes. And the types of what types of planes were they typically flying? These fighter escort groups. Well, we had two groups that were flying uh, escort for us. One was a P-38 group, and the other was the Tuskegee Airmen uh, in the P-51s. They had the red, red tails and the red spinners. Okay. And uh, uh, at times, uh, on, the, uh, on our intercom, we could turn, turn to uh, interplane conversations, and we could hear them talking to each other. Uh, when they spot planes and what they were doing mm -hmm. to uh, confront the enemy, and uh, we didn't stay on that those channels very long, but w w we used to hear them uh, over the channels. Okay. Did you ever get to to hang out with them when you were on the ground back at the base? Did you spend any time with them? No, guys? no. They were at different bases. Yeah, perhaps. they were. The only ones we did uh, meet were the P thirty eight. 
uh, flyers. And it was because uh, we were coming back from a mission and uh, we were transferring, the, our engineer Jerry was transferring the gas from the outer tanks and uh, the, he caused a vapor lock where there was, uh, it's, it's like an air between the, the, the fuel. And we lost three engines over the Adriatic. We dropped like a rock. And uh, fortunately, he, he switched the, uh, the, the uh, uh, tanks, so the, the engines, as they were windmilling, they, they caught up again. And uh, our pilot, Joe, didn't want to take any chances, and he, they were the closest base to us was a, a P-38 base. Mm -hmm. So we, we landed our plane at a P-38 base, and... Uh, we were interested in the P-38s, of course. All of us wanted to be pilots. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were uh, crawling all over the P-38s. And, and oddly enough, they were that much interested in our plane. Mm -hmm. You know, they couldn't get over all the armament, armament we had, uh, how big the plane was. And uh, they were crawling all over. Their, their pilots were crawling all over our plane. And so sort of a mutual and that, I was just going to say, that's uh, exactly what it was. Society. That's pretty neat. Okay, well, we've talked a whole lot about your experiences in flying, and I'm sure that you have a couple of unusual stories to tell. And I can think of two that you mentioned to me previously that maybe you could recount again. And one is of the prisoners who commandeered the German plane. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that, please? Well, the, the plane that... Uh, our, our uh, navigator Pete Wilson was in when it uh, was shot down over Austria. Uh, the pilot, the, the co-pilot, and I think it was a bombardier uh, were, were captured and, and they were in an Austrian jail. And it was, it was uh, toward the end of the war and the Russians were coming in from, from the west they were closing in on, on uh, Vienna, and uh, I, the the Germans really did not want to be captured by the Russians. They feared the Russians something awful. So this Captain Steves, who was the, the pilot of the plane that was shot down, he uh, played on their fear and was telling them that he, he could take them back to uh, uh, the American base as a, as a prisoner of war, mm -hmm. and uh, he finally talked them into uh, letting them out. So they let them out, and they they went over to they had these Ju fifty uh, twos, these Junkers Ju fifty twos, which was a tri motored plane they used for uh, parachuting and, and supplies and stuff like that, and. Um, there was two of them on the hard stands, and uh, Steve says we later found out one of them was half filled with gas and one was filled with gas, and they picked one that was half filled with gas. By mistake, uh, I'm assuming. Yes, and um, the 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 guys that they they uh, let them out were 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 pilots. They were pilots of those planes, so. Uh, when they they got in the plane, didn't you say by 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 the way that when you when they got on the plane they had a brief encounter with one of the runway guards and their girlfriend? Yes, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> yeah, so tell us about that just for a second. Well, when they got to the plane, uh, they they got inside and uh, the guard who was supposed to be guarding the plane was in there with his girlfriend. Okay, and uh, so they booted him out. They. Well, he, he was uh, afraid of being reported, so uh, he didn't really need to pay too much attention that there were Americans that were trying to get on the plane. Okay. So uh, uh, they, they took, a, took the plane off, and, and the sergeants who marched them out was the, was the pilot okay. of the plane. So Steve's had in mind that he was going to come back to uh, Pantanella, and he was going to give them uh, the the code numbers and the call letters of the plane that it was shot down. Mm -hmm. And he was going to land, he, he really wanted to land that uh, Ju-52 on an American base. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, he took the plane with the half-filled 
tanks of gas and he didn't make any further than Yugoslavia. And they landed in Yugoslavia where the Germans were immediately taken as prisoners by the Yugoslavs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Captain Steves and the other couple of guys were shipped back to our base where they, they uh, had a, a special meeting and they related their tales and, and what, what happened after they were shot down. Uh, now, at this time, we, we try to get some information about Pete Wilson, but they really didn't, didn't have any a clear story on, on what happened to him. They know that he was deceased, he was killed, but mm -hmm. later on, <clears throat> uh, I would say within the past three or four years, I got some information and found out that Pete was buried over in, in Austria. Now, while you were stationed in Italy, I'm sure you occasionally met Italian civilians or had encounters with them, and you told me about a very unusual one, which I hope you would tell us about again now. <clears throat> well, we were confined to the base uh, most of the time because uh, we were on call for uh, flight duty. So if we went off the base, we had to be back before uh, five o'clock at night. <clears throat> so uh, we were, I, I uh, just went to a, a couple of the towns that were not too far from us. The immediate towns around us were off limits because they were so small and they didn't want them overrun by the Americans. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I opted to go to Barry, which is about 70 miles away and uh, ride on the back of a, a, a truck, six by six truck, and most of the time was consumed in travel, and I didn't ha have a lot of time there. <clears throat> and I was walking down the street in, in Barrie, and someone behind me said, have you got a cigarette? So at that time, I was smoking, and I turned to see who, uh, who it was. And I saw this little old Italian man there, and he was the only one behind me. So I asked him, uh, did you ask me for a cigarette? And he says, yes. So uh, I says, uh, gee, you speak English very well. I, how, how did you learn to speak that well? He says, well, I lived in, in uh, the United States for a number of years. And uh, <clears throat> I said, whereabouts? And he says, well, you wouldn't know where it was anyhow. He said, he said it was a small town in Connecticut. <clears throat> so uh, I said, well, I come from Connecticut, and I, I live in West Haven. And that was the town he lived in. He lived in West Haven. And West Haven had a, an amusement park they called Savin Rock. And uh, he was describing Savin Rock to me exactly the way it was uh, in, the, in the years prior to my being born. Because he was an elderly man. Mm -hmm. But yet he had the places down. He had the names down. He was telling me about this. And I was flabbergasted. And how could I meet a person this far away from home who came from the same town that I did? Unbelievable. And, That's a strange uh, infection. Uh, yeah. That's incredible. Unbelievable. That, unfortunately, you didn't exchange information and keep no, in touch with them. No. God only knows what would have happened if you had. You know, I was so dumbfounded that I saw it. I, I, I didn't even have the sense to ask him for his name and, and where I could contact him again. Interesting. Okay, well. Why don't we get to sort of, perhaps on a little bit lighter note, and what I'd like to ask you now are some questions about uh, various things like staying in touch with your family and so on. Did you correspond with family members throughout the war, send them letters, and they would send you care packages and letters and so on? Or? Uh, well, I, I, I can tell you, I, I used to correspond with my, my family, uh, my mother and father. Uh, I used to write them an email, at, uh, a V-mail, that's what they used to call it at that time, where they used to, you write a letter and they used to uh, photograph it and reduce it, and they used to send uh, loads of them home. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I used to write in, uh, a V-mail every, almost every night. Mm -hmm. And I didn't just say that I was well, and I didn't talk about the weather and stuff like that. Uh, and my, my mother used to send me uh, uh, packages from home. So uh, I, she sent me a package, and uh, 
when I received the package, it was soiled in the corner of it, you know, and I know she was sending me some peanut butter, so I thought the peanut butter had, had uh, no, oh no, wait a minute, I thought it was, I thought it was, um, she, she had a, 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 a bottle of uh, cherries in there, but she put, she put some brandy, she took the liquid out of the cherries and she put brandy in it, so she's sending, a, a, sending me a, a jar of, of uh, uh, cherries in brandy. So when I saw the uh, soil, the box was soiled, I, I, said, I thought that the, the brandy was broken. So I opened it up and it was peanut butter that was broken. But I had the, the, uh, the jar of, of, of cherries with brandy in it. And I, I wasn't much of a drinker at that time, so uh, we, I shared it with my crew members and some of the uh, fellows around me. But it, it, they were uh, amused at the fact that she sent me something like that in the mail. That sounds neat. What was the food like that, that they served you when you were back on base? Uh, the food was uh, typical army army food. You know, they had braised beef and they had uh, Vienna sausages and uh, stuff of that nature. Uh, they had uh, powdered eggs. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this one of my crew members, uh, Red Core, and myself, we went to uh, a, a, a city close by called Cherignola, and uh, we went on a Sunday. And we both uh, had uh, egg and chips, that's what they call them. And I think it cost us $10 each to have egg and chips. That was a lot of money then. That is. <laughs> and, and, but they were, re they were real eggs and, and french fries. And we went to a family's house and they, they served us. It, it was wonderful. It's a very special luxury, I'm yeah. sure. Um, did you feel a lot of pressure and stress and how did you deal with that? Or did you just tend to get used to it and just kept on going, or day by day? Uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, uh, I never felt any stress at all. You didn't really feel a lot of adrenaline no. when you were up it, here? Well, at the time it was happening, of course you're stressful. Mm -hmm. But after it was uh, completed, that day was completed, uh, I just never gave it any more thought. Um, and I think that's the way the, the, mes the, the rest of our crew was, too. They, they, we were a very close-knit group. Mm -hmm. uh, there was 10 of us from spread out throughout the country, from California to New England. And uh, that must have really broadened your, I'm sure before the war, you hadn't been all over the United no. States, except for during your training. So these yeah. guys gave you kind of a sense of what it was like to live in, to live in different parts. Yeah, uh, especially California. John Margaroli, who is our, our ball gunner, uh, he was actually he was 32 years old. That was a, that was real old. That was ancient. Uh, he was like our grandfather, you know. <laughs> but uh, he was a wonderful guy, and uh, he used to tell us stories about California. And I, I can't imagine ten people with different personalities getting along as well as we did. I, I mean, we loved each other. They were like brothers. So that was very very fortunate then. And that probably helped relieve any stress because you didn't feel alone. You were sharing. That's right. We did everything together. Uh, the, the fact that we, the six of us were in one tent kind of isolated us. Uh, we knew the, the guys in the, in, in the tents that surrounded us, but mm -hmm. uh, mainly we, we uh, stayed together. Okay. Did you do anything for good luck? carry anything with you throughout the war or? No. Okay. How about entertainers or entertainment? Did you have, you know, Bob Hope or other celebrities come to your base? No. Or USO events you went to or? No, there was none of that. The only entertainment we had is when we were forming up the missions. I, I used to turn on the radio and, and, and get the uh, the Andrews singing rum and Coca-Cola and all the big bands playing music. That was our entertainment. But I'll tell you something. Okay. Um, when we went, when we had a mission, we, we wouldn't know what the mission was. We, we wouldn't even know we were flying the next day mm -hmm. until we saw our name on the board. And then we went to briefing and they, they 
showed us the the mission. It was totally secret. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were flying in our uh, uh, forming up, sometimes we used to put on Axis Sally, and she was uh, a propagandist from from Germany, telling us that. Uh, our, our wives and girlfriends are running around home while we're over, we we're fighting a war and all that stuff. But she used to come out sometimes and say, the 464th, we know you're going to bomb Vienna today and you're not going to come back and tell us all these crazy things. And she, how did they know? I don't know how they knew, but they knew the targets. Well, we didn't even know uh, until a few hours before. I would think that might make you a little nervous, quite frankly. But, but that, that was commonplace, I guess. I, I, I heard other people say the same thing about that, you know. Uh, but I, I just listened to her for the music. She used to play all popular American music, too, to get the people to listen to her. Right. But uh, I used to turn, tune in mostly to the American station they had there. Okay. Um, can you recall any particularly humorous or unusual event, like maybe a prank that you guys might have played on each other or something like that or since you were so close you must have done that from time to time well we were always kibitzing around uh red and myself being the youngest uh uh chick our, our co-pilot he was only a year older than we were mm -hmm. uh yet he used to say we used to keep the place lively i i can't point to any particular thing but we i guess we were uh, always kibitzing around and yeah, providing a few laughs here and there, but I, I, nothing in particular. Okay. Now obviously, you have a lot of photographs which you've shown me, and those hopefully will be copied uh, to go along with your interview. And you did keep a personal diary, I believe, which you would write down a little summary of each of your missions and what your impressions were. And I believe you did that covering all 35 of your missions. Isn't that true? Yes, yes. You still have that book, so that, that, yes. can, be, that can be copied today. Um, and then you, of course, have a tag from one bomb from each mission. Yes. Okay, that's, that's fabulous. Okay, so hopefully all that information will be copied to go along with this interview. Um, do you recall the day that your service ended? In other words, when the 35th mission was over? I believe you said something about having a couple <laughs> shots of brandy or... Yeah, well... Guys corralled you for that or... We, uh... We were entitled to have a shot of, uh, usually it was a double shot of uh, brandy after we come back from a mission, but I, I wasn't a drinker and I, I just, I said, well, save them for me until I finish up. And uh, the day I finished up, uh, they, they had prohibited buzzing the tower uh, because uh, some of the guys are getting a little too close to the tower because when they finish their missions, they used to run the, down the runway and buzz the tower. Uh, Joe, our pilot, was, he was a little more conservative, but he wanted to do something. So he did the same thing, only he wasn't, he didn't go as low as they did. Some of these other ones are just about above the runway. Mm -hmm. But he was a little bit higher. He, he went down the runway and then, get, uh, he banked sharply and then come in and landed the plane. And then I was advised to go up to the office they got your brandy waiting for you. All the, all the brandy you haven't had over the rest of your missions were, is, is waiting for you. Okay. So I went up there and I had my brandy. You consumed your fair share of brandy at that well, time. Well, I, it didn't take much, but I had too much, to be honest with you. Okay. Now, when you came back, I, did you come back to the States before the war actually ended? You came back? Yes. Before, okay. You came... And you came back to Connecticut, I'm assuming. Yeah. Well, when I come back to the States, they sent me down to Laredo to a... Uh, I, I was training to be a, a gunnery inspect, uh, in, uh, instructor on a B-29. Now, a B-29, uh, their uh, firing apparatus was completely different from, from the B-24 because it was remote controlled and you were in a climate controlled cabin and all that. So I was down in Laredo to uh, learn the B-29 system so I could teach it to uh, uh, new, new gunners. But, of course, the war ended. The war ended at that. that time. Okay. Now, you went back home and you went straight to work. Is that true? Yes. More or less? And, yeah. And you went to work as what? What was your profession then? Well, at the time, I was just a machine operator. Okay. And... Uh, like at, a metal... like. 
like lathing or something like that? Well, it was uh, automatic screw machines that made parts out of uh, bar stock. Okay. And I held about three or four jobs, and I was always, uh, if there was a layoff, I was the first one to go because I wasn't skilled, mm -hmm. and I didn't have uh, uh, any particular uh, skill that I, mm -hmm. so at that point, I went to college, I went to evening school. And where, where was that? At University of New Haven. Okay. And was that on the GI Bill? No. This is, this is uh, a few years after the GI Bill. I didn't take advantage of it, which was foolish of me. Okay. So you, so you, and that took you, going to school at night, you took 12 years to earn a degree in engineering? Uh, I, I had two uh, degrees in engineering and a degree in uh, business administration. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, when I went, I, the, the place I was working was paying half my tuition, and uh, I, I stayed there until the day I retired, although it was, the company was bought out by several different companies. And when I left the company, I was operations manager. And what, what year did you retire? Uh, In the 1980s, perhaps, or early 90s? I, I, let's see. Where's Marguerite? She knows. 22 years ago? It's uh, 23 years ago I retired. Right around age 60 then, perhaps. 61 I was. Okay. Now, obviously, you were very close with all the guys on your crew, uh, and you've maintained contact with them throughout the years. You've seen them periodically. Is that true? For, yes, yes. For, uh, I assume, bomb group reunions at different places around the country, or... Well, we have our own own reunion. There was five of us that uh, we could get a hold of. The rest, we we knew that two had passed away. Two, we uh, we we couldn't locate. Uh, so there was there was five of us, five of us when uh, uh, we we finally got together and we had a reunion among ourselves for every couple of years. Okay. And I still contact them. I talk to them over the phone, or I, I, I see this fellow in Massachusetts. We, my, my wife and I go up to meet him up at the, uh, uh, right on the border in Sturbridge. Sturbridge Village, yeah. And his name is Red. Uh, Red Core. Okay. What, what, what position was he on the plane? He was the uh, upper turret gunner. Okay. So gunners stick together, evidently. Yeah. Okay. And do you belong to any veterans organizations? No. No? Okay. All right. Well, is, is there, would you say, could you sort of, sort of describe how your military experience may have influenced your thinking about war in general, about the military, just about life in general? What, you know, how did it change your perspective on things by having been in the service? Well, first of all, uh, it changed my life a lot as far as uh, usually when you in a, in a town in, in, in a small town like in Connecticut, you don't really go out to see the rest of the world the way, uh, we, the way I did. To see, the, see how other people in other parts of the country live in, in uh, the different customs in other countries uh, was a revelation to me because I, I was only 18. I didn't have any uh, knowledge of other than than what I read in books, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it gave you a, a, a better understanding of people in different places. Okay. Is there anything else that you would like to add, or any closing comments that you might like to impart to the viewers? Well, you know, one thing that was interesting is that this uh, Red Corps. His name is James Corps. Mm -hmm. Is, his name is James Francis. My name is Francis James, and we're a day apart as, as far as age. <clears throat> uh, he has gone to some uh, uh, 464th group uh, reunions, mm -hmm. and uh, some of these reunions they invited some of the uh, very gunners, uh, anti-aircraft gunners who were shooting at us, and they invited them back to this country, and. Uh, they were very amiable people, and, and uh, 
you find out the people are the same no matter what. They had a job to do, we had a job to do, but they, they became the best of friends. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these people are, are still contacting uh, the, the, the Austrian uh, anti-aircraft anti gunners. And uh, sometimes they contribute letters to this newsletter that the 464th group puts out every once in a while. And uh, it, it shows you that there, at the time there was uh, animosity, but now they're just as friendly as your next door neighbor. So brotherhood uh, is much stronger than, than war and, and divisions between people. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Well, Frank, it's been a great interview. We thank you very much for your contributions to the Veterans History Project, and uh, I think it's going to be a valuable experience. Your experiences are valuable, and, and a lot of people will, will benefit by viewing them and seeing them. So thank you very much. Uh, it was an honor for me to do it, really. Well, I'm glad of that. Great.